My name is Dr. Diane Evans, um, allopathically and osteopathically board certified, and i um, here today with Dr. Patrick Beeman, who is allopathically board certified. And today we're going to go through the ABOG case list made ridiculously simple. One of my uh, friends I've worked with, Mark Gladwin, put together microbiology made ridiculously simple. And I was thinking of the best way to how to demystify the case list. So we came up with a PowerPoint and some introduction tools to help you go through your case list systematically and try and figure out the best way to organize it. So for the case list, as you know, there's OB office in GYN. Now for the OB, all patients delivered in the last 12 months or an 18 month case list or for some people a residency case list is what you'll have and sometimes if you're in a specialty such as Eurogyne the board will provide you a case list for Diane all, what about yes. that um, what, what do you mean the board will provide you a case list well there's certain specialties say you do a fellowship in urogynecology and you've been a fellow for three years and you wait to take your boards until the fourth or fifth year what happens is when you're a certain time frame out sometimes the residency case list is no longer applicable because of the time period and sometimes the board will say we will give you an OB case list or perhaps you've already taken the boards before and you've already used that residency case list and you're resitting for the boards, then sometimes the boards can provide a case list for OB. And they can do it for each one of the categories, but it depends on the circumstances. So it's something if you're a subspecialist and you don't practice OB or you don't practice GYN that you would have to contact the board to get specifics about. Okay, and that's good for people who will be looking to do this in uh, the upcoming years, but today we're going to focus on preparing the case list and perfecting it for those who need to submit by the August 1st initial deadline and the mid-August 15th uh, final deadline, or actually it's uh, is the final deadline to submit your case list. But we're going to make it easy so everyone's going to be able to not pay the extended fee and get their case list in on time today. So the other categories are office, which are 40 patients, um, and there's 40 categories, and you have to have one to two patients per category, and it's a patient that you've seen any time in the last 12 months, and then that is a very unique case list, and as we will go through it, you get to pick what office patients you want, and we'll talk a little bit of what are the best patients to pick for the categories. And then the last section we'll talk about is GYN, and these include all the patients that you've operated on in the last 12 months, or an 18-month case list, or a residency case list. And again, sometimes, as I mentioned before, sometimes this is provided by the board. Now, this is 2015 data that I got online, and it just looks at future um, basic written and basic oral, and you can see the overall pass rate is 83.7 for the basic written and 83.2 for the basic oral. So the total failure overall for the oral boards is um, somewhere around 14 to 16 percent. So the most important thing is, is can we adequately prepare our oral board so we don't end up in that 14 to 16 percent? And then I did put the link down here that if you wanted to find the ABOG bulletin to read through it and know exactly what the expectations are for the case list, I think that's very, very important. The most important point is not to take this case list lightly. Organization is really the key, being prepared early and getting your case list reviewed. So here's a, a flow that Dr. Beeman helped me with here. And you can see the case list time flow. You start case list collection the year before in July. The best way to do this is organization. Keep an HMP uh, op note and pathology. And one of the things I like to do when I do my dictations on my op notes or if I have, I use EPIC. And so on EPIC, I usually put in clinical indications. And what that does is it summarizes the HMP. So I know exactly 
wh how old the patient was, what her gravity and para was, why uh, we decided to do, say, a hysterectomy, what were the pertinent findings on her endometrial biopsy and her pap, how big was the uterus. And I put all of that in as a clinical indications so I don't have to keep referring back to the HMP and I can just look at my op note and pathology. Um, in December, getting the ABOG software, now um, ABOG requires you to use their software and start entering data. And then June through August, where we're at now, is getting your case list reviewed and getting your case list submission by the deadline. Accountability is making sure that you try and stick to the schedule and proofreading, I think, is key. Making sure everything flows and looks very organized before you submit it. Now, so the recommendation is, yes, be prepared, be organized, be diligent throughout the year. Um, what if somebody is, it's now, say, July, mid-July, um, still time to get your case list together? Absolutely. If you're a little bit of a late bloomer, like I like to call it, um, one thing that's going to be very important is to incorporate your office staff to help you. So one thing you can do is, especially with our electronic medical records, it's very easy to go through and have medical records print out all of your surgeries that you've done and have your office staff print out your HMPs, your op notes, and your pathologies. That's busy work that someone else can do. And then to put them in a category uh, according to uh, what they are. So if you give your nurse a, a, a book and it has different folders for each section, she can actually help you uh, put each of these categories together and that'll really help. And then if you're starting in July, it's probably a good idea to get your case list reviewed by someone who's gone through the boards before so, so uh, they have some familiarity with the program or to elicit help from an outside source because in July, it's kind of hard to learn everything on your own. You don't necessarily need an expert review of your case list if you follow this algorithm and start early and read very carefully through the ABOG bulletin because ABOG tells you exactly what they expect your case list to show. The biggest thing is when you're preparing your case list is you need to show the standard of care and you have to have the pertinent information on there. And they're very specific regarding that in terms of your gynecology case list, how big are the pathology, so how big is the uterus, how big is the uterine cyst. And having someone who is familiar with the case list review review your case list before you submit it will be important. So let's talk about the basic approach for each list. So there's first steps is plan the format. So present the patient in the best light. Patients are one use only and and Patrick I really like how you did this. Um, and that's a very important concept. So say, for example, I have a lady that I delivered and I delivered her and I did her tubal. I really can't put the tubal on the gyne list and the delivery on the OB list. They have to, you have to kind of combine them on the same list. And a lot of people say, well, what happens if I did her postpartum tubal ligation? six weeks later. How do I do that? And the way you would do that is you would do your OB case list and you would write on in the postpartum column bilateral tubal ligation at six weeks postpartum. And then that way you have uh, have put your tubal ligation and your delivery on the same on the same patient. The second steps is to summarize the details. And this is what I was saying before to ensure standardization and internal consistency within each case and amongst all cases. And one of the things that I see and I review hundreds of case lists a year and I'm very fortunate to meet wonderful obstetricians along the way as an obstetrician, we have so many different ways of saying things, and through the case list, especially OB, I see this all the time, and I'll give you a great example. Prior CD times one, previous CD, CD times one. So that's all three different ways to say the same thing. When we go through our case list, we want to be consistent. So 
I would just say prior CD. And what you can do and in, in enlist your office staff or your spouse or your partner in OBGYN, say, I need to make sure I'm doing things consistently. Can you look on all of my cesarean sections and make sure I, I'm saying prior CD? Similarly, if they're a gestational diabetic, some people will write GDM. A1 or GDMA2, but in other places, they'll write gestational diabetes, diet controlled. Now, we know they both mean the same thing, but consistency is important to to write it in a certain way each time. So I think a lot of uh, physicians, um, being as meticulous as they are, uh, might worry, oh man, what if I miss like one instance? My guess is that's probably not going to get your case list rejected if um, you're inconsistent once, twice, maybe, right? Right. But the the big thing is being consistent um, with OB. It, it just helps the case list flow. It helps the examiner be able to read through your case. The second thing is with GYN, it's it's almost imperative that when you're presenting the pathology that it's consistent. Because if you are representing each pathology in a different way, it makes it harder for the examiner to go through the case list and and read it. And so consistency, I think, is important. And then the third step, um, think like an examiner. Look for holes in possible questions a case raises, where you decide and how and what to study. And I think this is going to be a great topic. It's going to be a springboard discussion for a next webinar we're going to do is basically how to use your case list as a study tool. And I'll have a couple of examples later on uh, where I'll uh, go through how to think like an examiner. So let me ask then, what are um, some reasons that uh, perhaps a submitted case list would be rejected? That's a good question. One of the things um, a case list number one is going to be rejected if it doesn't have the minimum amount of cases on there. So you need at least 20 OB cases and at least 20 GYN cases. That would be the big thing. Um, the other reason that the case list would be rejected is if you don't get it in the uh, appropriate time frame, you, you submit it past the deadline it would be another reason uh, to be rejected. Um, the third reason would be if you did not put all of your cases on there. Um, and so there is an external audit that everyone is when they sign and they deliver their case list, ABOG does reserve the right to audit people. And if a case is found to have been purposely not placed on there, say you had a maternal death and you decided not to place that maternal death on the case list, that could be another reason why that case list may be rejected. So there's lots of different reasons. But one thing that's imperative, and I have to really impress this, is you really need to read through the bulletin very, very carefully and make sure that you are complying with ABOG's requested um, material submission. 